So I welcome everyone for this uh, webinar on UDS simulator. Uh, am I audible to everyone and is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so we'll start off uh, with the with the presentation. So today's session, what we have is about UDS simulator and also UDS stack. So as part of the agenda, we will initially see what is what are diagnostics, what is UDS, and then we will go into what is it we offer in as a UDS simulator or a UDS stack. And then we will have a short demonstration of the UDS simulator, which we have created. So this will be the agenda. So let's start off. Uh, I'm Sandeep Bhupati Raju. I have about 18 years of experience in the automotive domain. I have worked for 12 years with Bosch, and uh, now we are working together with Ansit. And as part of Ansit, we have recently developed this UDS simulator and UDS stack. So when we start off with UDS simulator, the first thing we always have to understand is what is diagnostics? Why do we need diagnostics? And uh, what do we do in diagnostics? So when this question comes to what is diagnostics, I always take the reference to a patient and a doctor. You, uh, me, uh, for anyone as a patient, when they feel ill, they go to a doctor and doctor asks a certain set of questions to the patient and tries to understand or diagnose what is the, what is the problem with the patient. So the same way, when we have lots of electronics which are being bought into the car, there can be some case where we have an issue and because of that issue, the functionality of the car will not be as expected. So we have to diagnose what is the reason why such an error is occurring. And that is where diagnostics come into picture. What is the problem? Why can't we do it manually? Of course, for ages, when, when there were no electronics or there were very minimal electronics, also we had service stations where service guys were repairing the cars. An error occurs, you go to the service station and the service guy will spend some time on your car or your vehicle and try to understand what is the problem. And then he will respond and correct that particular issue, what is there in the car. But the difficulty in doing so without any electronics or without diagnostics is that it is lots of, it is a huge time consuming activity because the service guy has to spend a lot of time to really see what could be the reason for that problem. And different service stations or different uh, service guys based on their experience follow different procedures. So there's no standard procedure for solving all the issues in your vehicle. So to overcome this with the, with the invention of electronics or electronic control units in the vehicles, also came in diagnostic protocols. So all your modern vehicles or your modern cars, which have ECUs inside them, they're equipped with something called as a diagnostic protocol by which the service guy can easily see what is the reason or what is the fault which is occurring inside your car and try to correct that particular issue which is there in the car. For example, in your car, let's say we have a sensor which is faulty. Then your electronic control unit or ECU in short monitors all such sensors. And when it identifies a fault, it stores something called as diagnostic trouble code inside the ECU. And when you take your vehicle to a service station, to get it to get uh, to identify what is the problem and get it repaired your service engineer could just connect a tool called diagnostic tester and read out the read out the, all the faults which are there in the car and exactly know what is the fault to quickly fix that particular fault 
So this is the need for diagnostics. So in the automotive world, there are lots of diagnostic protocols. There are protocols like KWP 2000, otherwise also known as ca uh, Keyword Protocol 2000. Sandeep, Bishmaya, Sandeep, can you yeah. project to your slide in slideshow mode? Because uh, it's not it is in slideshow mode right now. Okay, okay. You want me to stop slideshow otherwise? No, no, no. We can see the next slide here and uh, your slide is not occupying the entire screen. Uh, okay, just uh, give me a moment. Yeah. Is it yeah. is it a good now? Yeah, is it? It's good now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, so we were discussing what are the different diagnostic protocols. So there are lots of automotive diagnostic protocols which are available uh, currently, like KWP 2000, which is otherwise known as Keyword Protocol. We have UDS, which is, which is the main topic which we will discuss today, the Unified Diagnostic Services. Then we have SAE J1939, which is uh, more like a diagnostic protocol standard for commercial vehicles. Then we have OBD, which is Onboard Diagnostics. So what are the different components which are generally, when we say diagnostics, what are the different components which are involved? There is obviously there is a tool called a diagnostic tool, which we also refer to as tester. And that is the, that is the client side of it, which actually is in the hands of your service, service person who uses the tool to diagnose what is the problem inside your car. So as we see here, this is the offboard diagnostic tool which we are speaking about. And the other side of it is basically the ECU network inside your car or inside your bikes these days. So these networks can be in different ways. Either they could be a gateway followed by different ECUs or there, could, there need not be any gateway. All the ECUs are connected to the same diagnostic terminal. Probably you would have already seen in your vehicles, in your bikes, or in your cars, which you use, there is a port called OBD port. This is the port where any diagnostic tester can be connected in your vehicle. And through that port, the diagnostic tester will communicate using a diagnostic protocol to diagnose all the different faults in your vehicle. And one such diagnostic protocol, which we will today majorly focus on, is UDS. So there are two different types of diagnostic systems in the vehicle. One is called onboard diagnostics and the other one is offboard diagnostics. As I said, diagnostics is all about your electronic control unit monitoring the monitoring your complete vehicle system and logging of errors. And these logged errors inside the ECU are supposed to be read out. So there are two ways of doing it. One is onboard diagnostics in which all the, these are all errors related to all the faults related to emission related systems. For example, I think uh, many of you are aware about the BS6 norms, Bharat State 6 norms, which are active now in India. So these BS6 norms are nothing but emission norms. So when you say emission norms, this is all related to your emission systems. Like you have carbon monoxide, you have carbon dioxide, how much amount of carbon monoxide is coming out. All these are monitored using electronics in your vehicles. So when these, when any of the system which is relevant to emissions is faulty, all such faults come under emission diagnostics. And we, when we say emission diagnostics, they are onboard diagnostics. And how does this onboard diagnostic is indicated? So it, there is something called a mill lamp in your vehicle, which will be glow, which will switch on to indicate that there is a fault in the emission system. So that's why it is called onboard diagnostics. Then we have offboard diagnostics. So other than the emission related things, there are many other things which we monitor or which we write. So those all systems come under offboard diagnostics. And 
What we are discussing about UDS today is about off-board diagnostics. UDS is related to off-board diagnostics. Okay, so I'll move forward. So we have seen that there are different automotive diagnostic protocols. So what is UDS now? As I said, today's focus is completely on UDS. So let's understand what is this UDS protocol or Unified Diagnostic Services Protocol. When we say UDS protocol, as I said earlier to UDS, there was protocol like keyword protocol, which is KWP2000, which was designed for diagnostics on UART. That means a medium specific diagnostic protocol. So KWP2000 was the only diagnostic protocol available at that time. Later, when CAN came into picture and diagnostics could be done faster, there was no protocol which was designed for diagnostics on CAN. So whatever KWP protocol was there that was adapted for usage on CAN, so there were lots of services or there was lots of information in the protocol, which was still dependent on K-line related diagnostics. So then came UDS protocol, which was defined, which is where we created a protocol, which is independent of the medium. So unified diagnostic services protocol or UDS protocol in short, is a protocol which is defined for diagnostics in automotive world, which is independent of the underlying communication medium which we are using. So if, as you see here, I think most of you will relate this to the ISO OSI model, which we have with the seven layers of the ISO OSI model. Why are we seeing this today? The seven layers of ISO OSI model. Any diagnostic communication generally when we speak about, we speak the seven layers of communication. So when we say UDS protocol, it is not one simple UDS specification alone or the application alone. It has a layer, multiple layers of multiple layers of implementation or software which takes care of different ways or different needs of communicating with the diagnostic tester. So here what we see is the seven layers of UDS protocol on CAN. So as we see the physical layer and the data link layer are the CAN protocol. On top of the CAN protocol, we have the ISO TP, or this is called the transport protocol and network layer services. On top of that network layer, you have session layer for managing of different sessions, diagnostic sessions. And on top of that, you, we have the UDS application, which is the Unified Diagnostic Services, defined according to ISO 14229-1. So today, when we say UDS, we are going to discuss about the application layer, the session layer, and the transport layer. So these different layers are what we will go. We are going to discuss. As I generally go in any of my sessions with the UDS, we'll start from the bottom. That is, we'll first see what is ISO TP or what is the transport layer. Why do we need it, and what is it all about? So ISO TP. So when we say diagnostics or when we say communication. The amount of data which is exchanged between a diagnostic tester and the ECU is there is no restriction. There is that it could be more than the amount of data which the lower level medium can transmit. For example, in this case, when we say UDS on CAN, uh, a CAN frame has a maximum of eight bytes which can be sent. But for a diagnostic request and response, there is no limit on just eight bytes. It can be beyond eight bytes. So now, how do we transfer or how do we send a request or get a response which is more than eight bytes or less than eight bytes? All that is handled using the transport protocol. So in the transport protocol, which is defined by ISO 15765-2, 
there are different frames which are defined or which are uh, defined like single frames, multi frames, which are first frame, consecutive frame, and flow control, which are defined for achieving this requirement of transmitting or receiving data which is more than eight bytes or less than eight bytes. So let's see what is a single frame. So let's say there is a, a data which is about eight bytes of data which has to be transmitted from the tester to the ECU or the other way that is ECU to tester, any of these ways. If it is just eight bytes, then you don't have to worry because a CAN frame can take up to eight bytes. So what we use is a single frame to transmit these eight bytes. Let me make a small correction here. It's not eight bytes because one of the byte of the CAN frame is used for transport protocol. So only seven, five, seven bytes of data can be sent using a single frame. Okay. So similarly, if you have more than seven bytes of data which has to be transmitted, then we go into a concept called multi-frame, which is first frame, consecutive frames, and flow controls. How do we do, what are these different frames? Using the first frame, the sender of the data will indicate that he's going to send, the sender is going to send more than eight bytes or more than seven bytes of data. The receiver on receiving a first frame understands that there's going to be more than seven bytes of data. That means there are lots of other frames which are going to come with data. So it indicates to the sender that I agree that you can send the next frames, but when you send the next frames, please send it in a specific manner. That is indicated using the flow control frame. So when the sender sends a first frame, the receiver will send a flow control indicating how the consecutive frames have to be sent, how the remaining data has to be sent by the sender. Once the flow control is received by the sender, the sender sends something called consecutive frames where each consecutive frame will have seven bytes of data. And let's take for example, we have about 20 bytes of data which have to be sent. The sender in the first frame will indicate that there is 20 bytes of data to be sent and then sends part of that data in the first frame, that is about six bytes of data. The receiver will send a flow control indicating I have received the first frame, I am ready to receive the remaining 14 bytes of data. And you have to send these 14 bytes in a specific way, which is called the, using the flow control frame. We are not going into details about what is the contents of the flow control or how it is, because that is not the scope of today's uh, webinar. So this is just an overview. So once the sender receives the flow control from the receiver, the sender will send the remaining consecutive frame, that is the 14 bytes of data in two consecutive, two consecutive frames. So this is how the ISO TP exchanges data. We have a small example here, which explains about what I am speaking. For example, if we see here, the first line uh, the first can frame which we are seeing that is 7c2 on id 7c2 with 03 marked in yellow that is a single frame that is indicating a transport layer single frame indicating we are going to send data less than seven bytes or up to seven bytes in this particular case by sending 03 we are indicating that we are sending three bytes of data which is 19 0, 2, and 80. So that's why that's a single frame request from transport protocol. The next one is a first frame. There's an example of a first frame, the 7D2, where we have 10, which is marked, 10 followed by 2F, which is indicating that there are 2F bytes of data which it is going to send. The 10 indicates that it is a first frame, and the 2F indicates that it is the number of bytes it is going to send as part of the response. So as part of, once the receiver receives the first frame, it, 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 gets, it sends a flow control. The flow control is identified by seeing the 30 in the first byte. So in this case, we see 30 followed by all zeros. This is a flow control frame being sent by the receiver. 
once this flow control frame is received by the ECU, the ECU sends the consecutive frames to indicate the remaining, to send the remaining bytes of data which it sent, which it started with the first frame. So it sends 21, 22, 23. So these are the consecutive frames through which the remaining data is sent to the tester. So this is in brief about ISO TP. So now we have seen what is ISO TP. We have seen what are what is diagnostics. Let us see the layer above ISO TP. Okay, we are not going into the session layer today. So we will be directly going into what is this UDS or the UDS application, Unified Diagnostic Services. Any tester and ECU communication happens in a format as request and response. A tester requests a specific service from the ECU and the ECU responds back to this request by sending a response. The response can be either a positive response or a negative response. A positive response indicates that the response is or the service which is requested has been performed correctly. If a negative response is sent, it indicates that the request could not be performed for a specific reason. So what are the different services? What are these different services which are available? As we started with UDS, we saying that we have to diagnose the ECU. Let us first discuss what are the different functionalities, what are the major functionalities of any UDS application. One application, of course, as we discussed all, while, all the while, is to read out the different faults which are there in the system. The second application is for measurement and calibration. So measurement and calibration is basically something like we want to read out certain parameters inside the ECU or we want to modify certain parameters in the ECU. So these particular activities are measurement and calibration. The third important functionality is flash programming, where we want to update our ECUs with a new software or changes, or we want to make changes in the software of the ECU. We have to do a sequence called flash programming. So all these three important functionalities are part of any diagnostic protocol. So all the UDS services which are mentioned here help in one way or the other to do one of this functionality. That is either to read an error or to, or to read out a particular information from the ECU or to write something to the ECU or flash programming of the ECU. Considering time, we are not going into the details of each and every service. So we will directly go into the next set of diagnostic services. So before we, each of these diagnostic services are grouped into a certain set, something like services which help in diagnostic and communications management, data transmission, basically as I said, for reading and writing of data to the ECU. Then we have stored data transmission. This is basically the reading of faults the services which we use for reading of faults from the ECUs and certain other routines for which help in flash programming or doing certain ECU related activities like input output control or routine control or request download, request upload and so on. So we, today's UDS stack which we speak about supports most of these but not completely yet. We are currently in the process of development still, but we will demonstrate some of these services for you. So before we go forward, so what are what do we offer? What do we offer for uh, with this UDS simulator or the UDS stack? Is in the current in the in the current situation of the automotive market, there are lots of new players coming into the market both in terms of vehicle manufacturers, as well as issue manufacturers, and also tool development 
companies, diagnostic tool development companies. So the, our UDS stack can be useful for both the manufacturers of the automotive or the issue manufacturers and also the tool developers. For the UDS, using the UDS stack, any new entrant into the market need not develop the complete UDS protocol for themselves. Our UDS stack is compliant to all the ISO specifications for UDS on CAN and can be easily ported to the customer's ECU and you can directly start using the diagnostic protocol stack on the EC. With the UDS simulator, we, we, are, we try to address the problems for the tool manufacturers where you want a black box for validation of your diagnostic tools. So from ANSET, we have developed a custom hardware combined with the UDS protocol stack to form, a, to form a UDS simulator to which any diagnostic tester can be connected or can, and you can start using UDS or you can start validating your diagnostic tools itself using the UDS simulator. So we will see one by one each of these solution offers offering so the first one is the UDS stack. As part of the UDS stack, we provide a library which is compliant to all the ISO specifications of a UDS stack. And along with that, we provide configuration files which can be used to configure according to the needs of the customer's requirement for UDS. An example is shown here. So we have different layer configuration files for different layers. So we have, of course, CAN IF is an optional configuration because it depends on the specific CAN controller which the customer uses. So this is just an optional configuration. If the customer is using an STM32 microcontroller, then obviously we, the CAN IF configuration can be used for the configuration of all the different CAN frames. We also provide the session layer configuration where you can configure, where one can configure all the different diagnostic services which have to be supported by the ECU and also other session layer configurations like timings. For example, we have P2 time, P3 time, all these different diagnostic timing parameters and all can be configured in the diagnostic session there configuration. Using the CAN TP configuration, we can we provide configuration possibility for all the CAN TP or the transport protocol related parameters like STMIN, BS Max, whether padding is required or not. If padding is required, what sort of padding is required? What is the maximum flow control frames which we can receive? What are the maximum time you have to wait for a consecutive frame? All such configurations are available for CAN TP configuration. Similarly, we have configurations available for each and every service as part of the UDS stack. So like, for example, DSC service, RDBI, WDBA, all services get individual configurations. So the user who takes a UDS stack gets the library files along with the set of configuration files, which allow the customer to configure each and every layer and each and every service according to the needs of the customer. So that is what we offer as part of the UDS stack. At this point, I just want to show, at this point, I just want to show this, uh, our project, which we have built for the STM32. So we have this particular protocol, we have a set of configuration files, like all the different service related configurations are available. Similarly, as I was showing you in the presentation, we also have configurations for different layers of communication. That is CAN-IF, CAN-TP, uh, even we have DEM, but DEM currently in this particular is only a supporting module, which is not a full length DEM actually. It is only a supporting module which is created. 
So one such example, which we see here is a DSC configuration file where you can configure what is the different diagnostic sessions which your particular ECU should support. In this current configuration, as you can see, we support three different, uh, three different diagnostic sessions. And if any customer want to add a different diagnostic session, the same can be added in this file. And the library will support that particular diagnostic session. Similarly, we also have RDBI where we can configure different DIDs, which the ECU should support for reading and the corresponding configurations for each of those DIDs. So going back to the presentation, so we have seen what is UDS stack and what is the configurations available for in the UDS stack. For more details, of course, we can connect back personally, where we can explain more in detail about each and every configuration based on the need. Going further, we'll see the other use case, which is the simulator. So today we will be showing you uh, the UDS simulator, which we have created. And the setup which we have currently made is something as we see in this, in this slide. Just a moment, give me a moment. Okay. So as we see here, what we are using, we have an STM32 uh, board with us, which is an ANSI trainer board. And on top of the ANSI trainer board, we have ported our UDS stack onto it. So this is the UDS simulator part, which we will be showing today. The UDS simulator is connected to the laptop through a USB to CAN converter from InnoMaker. And in the in this PC, we will be using a tool called Busmaster to show all the CAN communication and to send a tester request and receive the response from the ECU. Before I proceed, any questions till now? Or can I continue? Sandeep, one question. Here, uh, UDS will support uh, multiple services. Uh, that UDS stack also having all that uh, services, whatever UDS supports, or only a few services which is required for your project? OK. So basically, the idea of the UDS stack is to have all the UDS services, that is, whatever list of services which we have shown here, all these services will be supported. At the current moment, all the services are not yet developed. We are currently in the process of developing uh, other services. So today we will show you some of the services which we already have, like RDBI, WDBI, security access, diagnostic session control, ECU reset. So these are some of the services. We also have other link control, communication control, and all that. But we will at least demonstrate some of the services for you today. But the idea of our stack from Ansit is that all the UDS services will be supported as part of the stack. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I uh, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, can we use a uh, J-Link from Segar or Trace32 from Lotterbag in place of ST-Link? Uh, okay, are you specifically referring to this connection here? Okay, so currently the board which we are using is an STM microcontroller based board which supports ST-Link debugger. So this board currently only uses ST-Link debugger for debugging. Understand, thanks. But if, if, you are, if the question is about is, the, is there any dependency on the debugger with the diagnostic or the UDS stack? There is no such dependency. Only if you have a UDS simulator which you want to use, for that we have to use it. We have to use ST-Link. Yeah, the rationale behind asking this question is uh, we are only using the Trace32 and the J-Link. So can we leverage using those tools in case if we are planning to set up the simulator? Yeah, 
Yeah. That's okay. It. So, so basically, which uh, which controller or which ECU do you use already? We use uh, i dot mx8, uh, Travio two, Travio one, and Qualcomm, etc. Okay. Okay. So basically, you uh, if I understand right, you want to use UDS simulator on these microcontrollers where you already have a setup. So if if you if the question is that, then yes. This particular UDS stack which we have can be ported onto that microcontroller, and then you can just use the same setup as you have. The UDS stack is independent of the we'll, we are making it independent of the microcontroller. It has to be integrated onto your microcontroller. But uh, did okay. I answer or uh, if I am not clear, please maybe you can ask me the question again so that I can clarify better. Yeah, so uh, the basically, so how can we leverage the existing setup, right? So we already have the hardware uh, connected with uh, the debuggers and then we test all the diagnostic features over there. What is okay. the value add that, you know, this setup will bring? Ah, okay, so may I understand your when you said your setup, is it like uh, you are on the tool side or you are on the ECU side? both okay so you are you have both the ecu side as well as the tool side so now when you when you say you have uh, ecu side where you already have all the diagnostic setup right so uh, you will already have this ecu which you are connecting to your diagnostic tester and then you are testing your validating your diagnostic tester or if you are speaking about validating the ECU itself, then I'm sorry, this is not the, uh, that is not the idea. When we have companies who are developing UDS tools, that is the UDS diagnostic tester tools, they do not have the freedom of having a UDS ECU with them or a ECU which completely supports the UDS protocol. So with this UDS simulator, we are trying to address those companies who are developing UDS tools and do not have the uh, benefit of having an ECU with them to test, to validate that tool. So you can just connect to this. This is an ECU, a black box. You can mm -hmm. just connect to it and send any diagnostic request and get back a response. In your setup, now coming to your setup where you said you already have an ECU with diagnostic software, as well as you have a diagnostic tool where you connected a lotter back. Of course, lotter back is only for debugging. But what we are speaking about is not debugging, but a tester tool connection to the ECU. In mm -hmm. that case, yeah, in that case, uh, of course, I think uh, ECU already, you already have an ECU. So this might not be the solution for that. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Please. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hello. This is Praveen. Yeah. Yeah, it means to say so same question actually if by this uds simulator we can check multiple services compared to previous one that is your i hope your uds simulator will go into work for my our issues okay so there are two different solutions which we are offering one is a uds stack which you can for example you have a new project in your company and you want to have a uds protocol stack for that particular project Instead of you developing a totally new UDS protocol stack, you could directly take the UDS stack from us, which you can port onto your ECU and you can start have using the UDS protocol stack. Because this UDS protocol stack will be compliant to all the ISO specifications which are required for UDS protocol, like 15765, 14229-1-2 and all that. So, if the question is, if we have an ECU, where can we use it? Yes, we, if you have an ECU uh, where you do not have any UDS stack right now, you could directly take a UDS stack. The UDS simulator, which we are speaking, is specifically for diagnostic testers validation. A black box for someone who wants to validate the other side of the diagnostic communication. Okay, okay. So if you are on the ECU side and for your project, you want to use a UDS stack, yes, we do have a UDS stack alone. That has nothing to do with the STM32 board, which we are speaking here, because that is a standalone UDS software stack, which we can provide you to, to be integrated into your ECU. Okay, okay. 
in the chat i think there is one more question can we have the complete setup and if yes what is the fees uh, i think uh, hamid uh, yes you could have the complete setup that is you want the ecu with the tools if i understand right you want on the tester side as well am i right is my understanding yes yes, yes. Yes. Yes, you can have the complete uh, setup on the tester side. Anyway, it is uh, bus master or depends on what kind of tool you want, whether you want to use a can case Excel or can OE and other things. So, but as such, yes, we could offer this complete solution for you. Uh, with regarding to the fees, probably you could uh, connect with Bishma and uh, he could provide you the details of the same. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other questions, so this will be the current setup, yeah, for our simulation demonstration today. So I I would also just give me a moment. I'll show you the live setup which we have here. Yeah. So I hope everyone can see the live video. So this is the STM32 board from ANSET. On top of it, we have already programmed our UDS. Uh, we have Im uh, implemented our UDS protocol stack inside this. This is the InnoMaker hardware, which we have connected to our, uh, which we have connected to the PC. And uh, in the PC, we will be using Busmaster tool for sending different requests and responses. Right. So we will also show kind of we have uh, simulated some of the errors to in the in this particular board. Like we have used a potentiometer to simulate a shot to ground and shot to bat errors. So we'll also simulate those errors and show you how to read the DTCs and other things here. Uh, am I clear till now? Okay, so please give me a moment. Uh, so this is a bus master tool which we have. Uh, this is uh, basically a tool which helps us in uh, doing the uh, sending the requests and responses. Of course, there can be any other tools which you can use, something like uh, uh, a Canoe, Can Can Case Excel, Canalizer or InnoMaker, InnoMaker itself have their own GUI. So you can use anything or you can even use your own diagnostic testers. So today we are using the bus master to send the tester requests and responses. So let's connect. So as we see here, right away, the we have uh, switched on a periodic tester present service. So the periodic tester present service is 3E a UDS service to indicate that the tester is present. So it is currently being sent every four seconds. So this tester periodic tester present helps us in maintaining the session timings. So we'll demonstrate even that. So first let's start an extended diagnostic session. So how do we do an extended diagnostic session? So we send 10.03. So we get a positive response from the ECU. So you can see the CAN trace here and you can see directly the diagnostic request here. So 5003 followed by the timing parameters of the session compliant to 14229-1. So right now we have started a extended diagnostic session. And in the current configuration, this particular extended diagnostic session is valid for a P3 time of 10 seconds. So if there is no request being sent for 10 seconds, then the session will time out. Okay, so let's see how the timeout happens. How do we see whether timeout has occurred? So what we will do is we will, okay, so let's try 2701. This is a security access service. Right now I'll not go, go through with completing the seed and key method. Right now, I'll only send the seed request where when I sent a seed request, I got a seed response from the ECU. 
So let's do stop the periodic tester present. Wait for 10 seconds to see if we can still be able to do the key request or not. Okay, so we have waited for 10 seconds. So let's send again 2702 followed by the key request. That is in this case, the key request is created to be plus one of the seed. So we will send the key request. And if we see, it says a negative response service not supported in active diagnostic session. That is because security access service is configured only to be supported in extended diagnostic session. And currently when we have stopped sending the tester present, periodic tester present, the diagnostic session has timed out and that's why the service is no longer supported. So let's do that again. Let's do that again in with the tester present on. So we will start the extended diagnostic session and followed by the extended diagnostic session request. Now let's do security access. So 2701 is the seed request for which we got the seed. The seed which we received is E320. So we will be putting E4. 21, this is how the algorithm was created in the security access. It's a plus one of the seed. So we are sending the key request now. So now we have cleared the security access. We'll recheck whether really we have cleared it. We'll send the seed request once again. Now, if we see the seed request gets a response 67010000, which indicates that the particular security level has already been cleared. So right now we have cleared the security level. So let's do a reading of F190, which is a DID, which has been configured for reading of win number in the ECU. So once we send 22 F190, we can see that we have received the win number. That is 62 is the positive response, followed by F190 is the DID. And then we have 17 bytes of win number here. Uh, so if we see here, uh, just a moment, I'll disconnect. So we can also see the consecutive frames and all that here. So the request, because it's only three bytes, has been sent as a ISOTP single frame with 03 followed by SID followed by the DID. The response of the ECU is greater than seven bytes. So we use the multi-frame concept for transmitting of response. So the ECU has sent on 78, it has sent that it is going to send 14 hex, that is uh, 20 bytes of information back to the, back to the uh, tester. So it has sent six bytes of information here. Once the first frame is received, the tester has sent a flow control frame with 30 followed by 0000, 000, 000 indicating all the data can be sent at once. So then the ECU has, after the flow control is sent by the tester, the ECU has sent the remaining consecutive frames. So where we received the remaining 14 bytes, six plus 14, total 20 bytes of information is sent from the ECU. Okay, so I have, because I have disconnected, so there could be a timeout. So please let me redo the diagnostic session. So I start extended diagnostic session. Let me do 2701. Okay, so as we can see, the security level has been timed out. Uh, security has been cleared again, reset. So we have to repass the security access. So zero D B B. So we send, so we clear the security. So next, what we will try is we will try writing of we'll change the win number which is there we previously saw the win number was one one two two three three so we'll send the win number the 17 bytes of win number we'll change it so let's try with not sending 17 bytes so the expected response from the issue is incorrect message length 
So as you see, you get incorrect message length or invalid format, 7F2E13. So now we will send the proper number of bytes. So we'll send 17 bytes of win number. So now we have got a response, 6EF190, that is the win number has been changed. So let's read back the win number with RDBI service, that is 22F190. So we can see that now the win number has been changed and the new win number has been read back using RDBI service. So next, what we will try to show you is we will try to create an error and uh, we will see if the error can be read. Can we read the DTCs? So before I do that, we I would like to show a uh, demo what kind of errors we have currently configured. So we open the dem conf. So we have three different errors currently. One is uh, the short to ground error, the short to bat error, and uh, one more temperature sensor related, but this particular uh, sensor failure, we are not able to reproduce now because in the current setup, we cannot do it. So what we will try to reproduce is short to ground and short to bat. So uh, this, both these errors will simulate using a potentiometer which we'll show you currently using the phone. So let me go back to the Android. Yeah, so as you can see, this is a potentiometer in the board. So we will set this to completely low, completely zero, to set the short to ground error. So we have set that particular error. And now we will request from the ECU. So this is the RDTC service, read diagnostic trouble code service. So we are requesting if there are any errors which are confirmed or pending. So this we are using 190108. We are only reading the number of DTCs according to this DTC status mask. So we get a positive response indicating there is one DTC which is logged in the ECU. So let's read now the DTC itself, which is logged. So we send 1902 request. So we send, and as you can see, we see the DTC number. This is 0A9B17, right? So 0A9B17. So this is the DTC which has been reported. Now, now let's, Try to, as we can, uh, as you can see here, we will now change the potentiometer to clear that error. So now we have set, sent it. There is a debounce time which we have set in our uh, DSM in the DEM. So we have to wait for few some time for that error to be cleared from the error memory. So before that, let's read if there is any more errors. So right now you can see it sends 00, zero indicating there is no DTC in the me error memory. So the error is cleared. So let's read again if there is any DTC. As you can see, there is no, because there is no error, there is no DTC which is reported. Now let's create the ground, the short circuit to bat error. That is, we'll put the potentiometer on the top, top side. So we have, I have now sent the particular, I put the potentiometer back to full. Now this is full. Previously it was zero, now it is full. So we will send if there is any errors which are reported. As you can see now, again, there is one error which is reported. And if you read the uh, DTC now, it should be, the other DTC, which is 252.1F. As we can see, that is the DTC number which we have configured for short circuit to bat. Okay, so this is some of the different things which, we, which are possible. Of course, there are many other things like we can change the baud rate, 
uh, we will be able to stop the normal communication using communication control. We can do other RDBA and RWDBI services as well. Uh, of course, we are in the process where we'll be ready with all the services, including flash programming, sequences, everything available uh, in some time. So right now we have demonstrated some of the services which are available, like reading of errors and uh, writing and reading of different data. So that's, that is what we wanted to show today as part of the UDS simulator. Anything else which you would like to know, we, we are here for some more time. Any, any more questions? So that's the end of my presentation and uh, demonstration. Hello. Hello. So this yes, is Praveen. Uh, can you speak up a little bit? I am not able is it to okay? hear you. Is it okay? No, this is Praveen. Uh, yes, Praveen, please. Yeah, actually a small question is a personal way. Actually right now, I previously I was using the Busmaster tool in our uh, testing case. Actually when we are converting CAPL to the CPP, we are uh, eliminating the signals errors, but we are unable to find the predefined functions. It will not be converting into the capital to CPP. Any the helping document which we are having, can you share it is with work on that? It is a other uh, personal information from your end in the bus okay. master tool. Okay. I was finding different uh, jailing other, but I couldn't find in the YouTube, uh, Google also information about the bus master. Okay. It was very so limited. Capital to, capital to which one you said? CPP. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, converting okay. right. Uh, yeah. But capital to CPP conversion because bus master will be allowed the CPP right. Uh, right. So yes. We, uh, yes. we are loading the capital converting to CPP. Uh, okay. we are previously, what I use a project, I written the capital when I'm trying to convert into the CPP a very first time. Okay. But all of the signals, uh, DB signals, previously it was some problem, it is cleared. We have mm -hmm. got a predefined function, I'm unable to debugging actually. I was seeing the different uh, information differently, yeah. but I couldn't find it limited okay. into the internet also. Okay. You know, a helpful document, uh, you can share it, yeah. it will be helpful to me. Okay, uh, I, I will uh, check this. I will okay. check this, but we have a different solution. Actually, we have another tool, oh. uh, which uh, which completely is a graphical way of writing capital programs, right? Oh. So at the end of it, you can generate either a CPP code or you can generate a capital code from that tool. Okay. So that's a different tool, probably uh, that uh, maybe we can have a connect uh, separately offline and uh, we can show you that tool as well. But of course, okay. now the question is you already have an existing capital program and that's what you convert, want to convert into CPP. Yeah. So let me have a look if we, we okay. have some, something which we can, where we can support you in that. Okay, area. okay. And uh, one more question here, you're unlocking the security, right? 27, then after 2702, even seed you after uh, right. got the seed after the key, you got unlocked. If you, again, in the same case, if you wanted to again locking uh, what we has to do, any alternative ways, different methodologies in your experience. Uh, meaning you want to lock that particular security? Yeah, previously locking right. Now we unlocked 2701, yes. 2702. Yes. Then again, you want to lock what he has to do. Okay. Uh, see, security access can be uh, locked in two ways. One, you change the session to a different diagnostic session. Okay. Or you or there is a timeout. That means you don't send any more requests. Automatically after the timeout of the session, it locks. Uh -huh. yes. We are we are already we are already keeping the same tester present. We'll keep it same only. What we should do. okay. So basically, you are maintaining the session using a periodic tester present. Yeah. Okay. So there is no other request to directly lock. At least UDS doesn't have a service to say now using this service you can lock it. But maybe you can change to a different uh, session. Maybe ten zero. You you resend ten zero three. Uh, for example, you go back to the same extended diagnostic session, automatically the security gets locked. Yeah, sessions we previously, I know, but any other alternatively? Uh, okay. 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 okay, okay, got it. Okay, alternatively without changing the session and without... Uh, because uh, I could I... find the question in uh, different areas, Any uh, how many number of ways? N number of ways ah, they're okay. asking. So lock, okay, got it. <laughs> to lock the security access, at least because uh, ISO says that security level should be maintained. There's no lock okay. unless there is a timeout or a change in uh, diagnostic session. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you.
Okay, I think there's one more question. What is the difference between onboard and offboard diagnostics? In both cases, MIL will be turned on. Okay, uh, so Bhargav, no. Uh, generally, onboard diagnostics are all emission related. When we say MIL, malfunction indication lamp, it is specifically related to onboard diagnostics or it is specifically related to emission related uh, diagnostics. So MIL will be turned on generally only for the onboard uh, emission related errors. For the offboard diagnostics, that means they are something which is not very critical, but uh, there are other errors in the system. Those only are, might not have a MIL lamp, but will have a warning indication lamp. In some vehicles, in some ECUs, you have two separate lamps. One is called a MIL lamp, malfunction indication lamp, and the second one is warning indication lamp. So you might have a warning indication lamp for uh, offboard related errors. That is not emission related errors. So hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Saranya, yes, uh, the session is recorded. So you should be able to see the session on YouTube. Uh, Bhishma, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think this is available on YouTube. Uh, yes, uh, Sandeep, this is available on YouTube. Yeah, so Saranya, I think you should be able to see this on YouTube as well. Any other questions from anyone? Okay. Okay, Sandeep, thank you so much for your session, Sandeep. Okay, so if no further questions, thank you everyone. Thank you for patiently listening to me. Uh, if you have still some questions which you could not ask, you can connect to us at any time. Uh, you can write to either Bhishma or to me, uh, and uh, we'll be happy to get back to you on that. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for a more detailed presentation. Thanks.